Hare Krishna. It's wonderful to be here amongst all of you today. And I will speak on the transformational power of the Bhagavad Gita. Especially as it is conveyed in its last verse. So the transformational power of Hare Krishna. The transformational power. Is there some loose connection somewhere? Hare Krishna, okay. Hare Krishna, that's a better transformation. <laughs> <laughs> so, the transformation power of the Bhagavad Gita. So, I'll take the last verse and I'll talk about some significant words, four or five significant words from the last verse. Uh, which will illustrate this theme of how the Bhagavad Gita transformed Arjuna and how it can transform us. <coughs> so the last verse of the Bhagavad Gita is, those of you know, who know it, you can recite after me. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho Dhanur Dharaha Tatra Shreer Vijayo Bhutir Dhruva nitir matir mama. So, this verse is stating that wherever there is the Lord of all mystic power, Krishna, and wherever there is the wielder of the bow, Arjuna, Partha, there there will be opulence, victory, morality. And all such things, wealth, matir mama, and that is my opinion. So, who is speaking the last verse of the Bhagavad Gita? Yes, Krishna is overall the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita, but this particular verse is spoken by Sanjaya. Sanjaya. Yeah, he's saying that matir mama. This is my understanding. So, I'll focus on. Let's depending on how much time we have, I'll focus on Dhanur Dharaha. Then I'll speak on Yogeshwara. Then I'll talk about. Matir Mama and Yatra. And if you get more time, we'll talk about Nitir, Nitir and other things also. <coughs> so, Dhanur Dharaha. What does that word mean? Dhanur is? Bo. Bo. Dharaha is? Bearer. Holder. Dharaha hai. You know, holding it. So, now, this word Dhanur Dharaha has a significant meaning over there. That, now, of course, Arjun was known as the archer. But at the start of the Bhagavad Gita, in the first chapter, he says that the Gandiva, my bow, is slipping from my hands. Gandivang Samsate Hastat Dvakchaiva Paridahiyate. So the Gandiva is slipping from my hands. And not only does it slip from his hands, actually he puts it aside. Visrujya Sasharam Japam Shokasam Vignamanasaha. Visrujya Sasharam Chapam. He put aside his bow and arrow. And Nayot Shaiti Govindam. I will not fight. So I cannot fight. I will not fight. So by hearing the Bhagavad Gita, the Arjun who had put aside his bow, saying I will not fight, has now picked up his bow in readiness to fight. Now the fighting <coughs> signifies actually. Arjun's willingness to do a difficult duty. It was a difficult challenge because his relatives and others were there on the opposite side. So when we face a difficulty in our life, at that time we may be disheartened. And just like Arjun put aside his bow, also we may say, I can't do it. I, I, I quit. So just as Arjun became disheartened, we also become disheartened at times in our life. And just as the Bhagavad Gita's message enlivened Arjun, similarly, it will again enliven us. So, Dhanur Dhara signifies the transformation that the Bhagavad Gita brought about. Now, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita itself, how many verses does it have? 
sorry 700 verses yeah <coughs> now out of them even if we consider all the verses although all of them are not spoken by krishna some of them are spoken by sanjay some of them are spoken by dhritarashtra uh, some of them are spoken by arjun even if we consider all the 700 <coughs> verses together if we consider the number of letters that are there in those verses uh, the number of syllables, number of letters, actually the whole length of the Bhagavad Gita is actually not more than the number of letters you will get on the front and back page of Times of India. So just by reading or hearing that much, Harjun became completely transformed. And the magnitude of his transformation to understand this is that for a warrior to put aside his bow, in the battlefield is an extreme thing. It's, uh, it's not that he's defeated, it's he's not ready to fight itself. Like say, now in a few months, the Cricket World Cup is coming. And say the Cricket World Cup final match is there. And say we have India's top batsman. And India, the match is about to begin, they're going to bat. They come on the cricket pitch, and then suddenly the batsman says, I can't bat. Batsman puts aside his bow. Puts aside, not his bow, his bat. <laughs> puts aside his bat. And instead so of standing in a posture, he just sits down on the ground itself. Hey, come on, this is not a time to lose nerve. You're a talented batsman, now you have to bat. So, of course, multiply this thousands of times. Because no matter how important we may consider World Cup to be, it's not that people's lives are at stake. There it was much, much bigger stakes. But they just gave an idea. So Arjun had got so discouraged. He just put aside his boy, I can't fight. And then still, by the end of the Bhagavad Gita, he became ready to fight. So what happened? What was the Bhagavad Gita's message that transformed Arjun like this? So each of these messages, I'll, I'll try to summarize in one sentence or a, a phrase. So this Dhanur Dharaha, this signifies the Gita's essential message. Look up and things will look up. Look up and things will look up. That sometimes the things are looking down. This is going wrong, that is going wrong. That everything seems to be gloomy, everything around seems to be gloom and doom. So at that time, when we feel that things are going wrong in our lives, at that time we are simply looking at those things and feeling more and more disheartened, we look up. Look up means, who is there up? Ultimately Krishna is there up. So the Bhagavad Gita raises Arjuna's vision upwards. Now, upwards means that First, there's a body, animating the body is the soul. And the soul of the soul is Krishna. He is the whole of whom we are parts. So the Gita raises Arjuna's vision, starting from the body to the soul. First, he says, how can I fight against my relatives? How can I kill them? It's, it's a reasonable argument. He cannot kill them. But <coughs> there is weakness and there is wickedness. When somebody has weakness, we can give forgiveness. So weakness means what? They have anger, they have greed, they have lust. And under the force of that impulse, they do something wrong. Then, okay, they are themselves repentant, they are themselves apologetic. So one time event, their intelligence, their moral sense, it's still strong. But somehow, the force of the movement sidelines it. The force of the desire, the force of the impulse sidelines it. So weakness leads to hot-headedness, where people do something wrong under the pressure of the moment. Whereas wickedness is not hot, it leads not to hot-headedness, but to cold-bloodedness. Wickedness, when it makes people cold-blooded, that means they very systematically, calculatedly plan how to do wrong. They plan how to hurt someone, how to fulfill, gratify their desires, no matter what the cost it may be to the other person. So when somebody, somebody has wickedness, to give them forgiveness is foolishness. 
Why? Because they have, they are not going to change because they don't even feel the need to change. Their inner compass has got so, so misdirected that they are using their intel, their moral sense has become dumbed. Their intelligence has become misused. So intelligence, instead of restraining them from doing wrong, they are using their intelligence to scheme how to do wrong. Such a person who is cold-blooded, they need to be, they need the punishment. Say, if somebody to understand why that fighting was required, what Krishna tells Arjuna is just don't look at the body. The body, yes, you have to kill the body, but why? To kill because Duryodhan has become so, so unconscionably wicked. Say Duryodhan tried to dishonor and disrobe Gopadi in public. Now this kind of horrible act, sometimes some brutal people do. But somebody when they do it, they will they will catch a victim who is unsuspecting on a lonely road or in some private place and do, do they try to do like that. But suppose somebody does it in public. That's even more brazen. Suppose somebody tries to do such an act in a police station. So that's outrageous. <coughs> you know, recently there was this attack in Kashmir on the Indian Defense Forces. It's got blood boiling. Because it is an attack directly, not on the citizens, not on the civilians, but on the defense forces. So Duryodhan was a person who was so wicked that so brazen that in the royal assembly where people where justice is to be given where punishment is to be given, there itself he was ready to do such a thing. And he was not in the least repentant about it. His only repentance was that he did not succeed in doing it. His only regret about the incident was that something happened and he couldn't succeed. So such a remorseless, heartless person deserved to be punished. And Krishna told him that still you are not fighting against them. It's remarkable and the whole Bhagavad Gita does not contain even a single word of incitement. See, he did like that to Draupadi, therefore you have to fight against him. The Bhagavad Gita doesn't talk in those terms at all. Although that is true, but the Bhagavad Gita's focus is on <coughs> that the soul and the body are two different things. And sometimes the body can become so contaminated and perverted by lower desires that that body itself can't be healed. Just like sometimes like a person's arm or some limb becomes contaminated by some some disease, a gangrene or something like that. Then the rot in that limb may spread over the whole body and kill the person. So that and doctor says amputate the body. Amputate the, that particular limb in the body. Now, that's painful, but that's what is required to save the rest of the body. So similarly, Krishna tells Arjun that, see, even Duryodhana is a soul. But that soul right now is covered by a wicked body. And unless that wicked body is separated from the soul, the soul cannot go free forwards and evolve. So what Krishna told Arjun to do is, see beyond the body to the soul and see that this will benefit not just you that you will get a kingdom that's not the purpose this will benefit even Duryodhan otherwise he will continue doing wrong and what will happen if you consider the social body like one wicked Duryodhan will will seeing him many other people also think I can also become wicked I can also abuse power like this that, that infection will spread that's the amputation that is required. Now, <clears throat> beyond this, so from the body to the soul, but beyond the soul to the whole. The whole is Krishna. So Krishna tells Arjun, don't think that you are fighting this war against the Kauravas. This is not a war between you and the Kauravas. This is not a war against anyone. This is a war for Dharma. This is a war to establish moral and spiritual order in society. And Krishna gave Arjuna a vision of how 
he as Krishna is the lover, is the well wisher of all living beings. Yajnatvana punar moham evam yasasi pandava yena bhutanya sheshani drakshasya atmanya thomai. He says that when you get spiritual knowledge, you will never fall into illusion. But you will see that all living beings are mine and are in me. Yena bhutanya sheshani drakshasya. You will see. Atmanya Thomai. See, they are all souls and they are all my parts. So, I care for them more than you can ever care for them. That applies to Arjun, as Arjun is Krishna's devotee, and that applies to everyone. So, when we look at our plans, and the plan doesn't seem to be working, sometimes we come to a situation where there is no good there is no good choice available. This is a bad choice, this is a bad choice, this is a bad choice. All that we can choose is which is the least bad choice. Sometimes we come to a situation in life like that. At that time, if we look just simply by our human vision and our human plan, this is a terrible situation. But if we look beyond, that there is a higher plan. Krishna is our well wisher and Krishna has a bigger plan for us. When we see that, then that gives us encouragement, that gives us hope. Even if things don't seem to be, none of our plans seem to be working, but Krishna's plan is still working. We look at the present and plan the future. Krishna looks at the future and plans the present. So, Because he looks at the future and plans the present, but sometimes from our present perspective, Krishna's plan may not make any sense to us. But there is a plan. So that's why when we keep looking at the situation, why is this happening like this? Why is this happening like this? Why do I have to do like this? That's what will perplex us. But look up. When you look up to Krishna, not just in a sentimental sense, but actually by practicing bhakti, we connect with Krishna. Look up with Krishna. Then, see Krishna's plan is still acting. And let me do my part in Krishna's plan. Let me do what I can to serve Krishna right now then things will start looking up things will start looking up that is the significance of Dhanur Dharaha that Arjun who had put aside his bow in discouragement picked up his bow in readiness to fight this transformation happened because the Bhagavad Gita helped him to look up from the body to the soul from the soul to the whole to Krishna and thus he saw that Krishna's plan is still acting although his plan seemed to be Thwarted. And thus, when, when you look it up, things started looking up. Okay, so that was the first point. So I, as I said, I'll be speaking these four points. And after each point, it would be nice if you could ref do some reflection. Any particular thought, any particular uh, point which struck you, anything you found relevant, anything you would like to share with someone else after the class, it's a point I liked. So is there any point which you would like to reflect right now? Yes, please. Krishna looks at our future and plans mm. the present. Yes, Krishna looks at the future and plans the present. And what do we do? Look at the present and plan the future. Now what this means is, thank you, it's very nice, it's an important point. An example we could have for this is, that say there is a doctor. And the doctor is treating a patient. Now the patient and doctor have the same purpose. It is to take to cure the patient. Now, the doctor may give an analgesic and antiseptic, a medicine for taking care of the pain and a medicine for curing the disease. Now, if the patient is a, is not very medically savvy, and the present patient is also stingy, and the patient finds actually this analgesic so cheap, this antiseptic so expensive. Mm -hmm. And the patient discovers that whatever pain I have, I just take the analgesic and the pain goes away. So why do I need to take the antiseptic? Now all the patient is saying is, looking at the present, I have pain, I take this medicine, the pain goes away. Now what the doctor is seeing is, actually the analgesic is fine, but the most important thing is the antiseptic. The doctor looking at the future, you have this infection within you, and if this infection is not removed, then things will become far worse. 
So the patient can't see the future problem that are going to come because of the disease that is inside the body. All the patient can see is that I have this pain, let this pain go away. But the doctor sees the disease and sees the prognosis of the disease. So the doctor may say, take this medication. Say, this is so bitter. And I take it and the pain doesn't go away by it also. No, take it. So now the patient says that, no, 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 I just want this analgesic. And the patient starts taking only the analgesic. And the doctor may say, no, stop it. You have to take this medicine. So sometimes similarly, what happens is, Krishna's purpose and our purpose is ultimately the same. That we all want to, we want to become happy, we want to become free from distress. But sometimes we seek some short term solutions. <coughs> ultimately, every material solution is a short term solution. We may have some, this problem, that problem, that problem. And we solve that problem, but after some time, some other problem will come up. So, most material solutions, they were required. It's like when the pain is there, pain medicine is required. But they, are, they, they may be necessary, but they are not sufficient. But we get too obsessed with this. You know, why is this job not working out? Why is this relationship not working out? Why is this health issue not getting resolved? Why is this weather so hostile? We just get obsessed with that. And even if that gets resol resolved, after some time, that problem comes back or some other problem comes back. So, when we seek material solutions alone and when we don't get material solutions, then we feel frustrated. Like it's, we seek a painkiller and don't get the painkiller. But when we see Krishna, what Krishna sees is that actually the focus on the medicine, the antiseptic. That antiseptic is spiritual growth. Sometimes when you're just looking at this level, this doesn't work. Let me try this way. Let me try this way. Let me try this way. We keep trying material things without turning to Krishna, without praying to Krishna. Yes, we need a material solution also. But the first look up. Look up and we see the big picture. And then things will start looking up and then we can move forwards. Thank you. So any one more point? Yes? Maybe a question, but as I'll say, I mean practically, um, in life we see lots of situations where it's hard to determine <coughs> if it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And because it's a perspective rather than a you know very clear right or wrong. And and you react to it. What's the guidance to not really react to things which are wrong? Okay. So sometimes we just do things which uh, there's no clear right and wrong and they react instinctively uh, at that time. Yes. Sometimes life just doesn't give us the opportunity to think deeply and uh, calmly about situations. I mean, we are just in the heat of the moment, we might take a decision. But then later on we can reflect and check. Sometimes we make the right decisions and sometimes we make the decisions right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I came to an intersection. I was not sure should I take left or right. Then I took right. I took right, and then I found oh, I went. I meant to go left. Then it doesn't. That doesn't mean we have to necessarily go back all the way. From wherever we realize, then we make the decision right and come on the road. Route. So similarly, at that time, we just have to use whatever intelligence we have and make the decision. Sometimes they say thinking on the feet. That's what you have to do. But broadly speaking, uh, uh, the Mahabharata says that right and wrong. Ultimately, there is scripture which tells us what is right and wrong. In terms of broad principles, scripture is like a compass, which is the direction you are going to go in life. But specific situations can be very complex. So there are three broad factors which can be considered by deciding. There is the content, the intent and the consequence. Content means what are we doing? So broadly speaking, we understand say speaking lies is bad. But suppose the child is not ready to take a medicine and the mother puts a medicine in a chocolate inside and use it. Mother says, is there a child says, is the medicine there? No, it is a chocolate. The mother will be saying uh, something is not exactly true, but that is for the benefit of the child. Sometimes if the child is not taking the medicine, that's required. So there is the content of what we are doing. There are broad categories for that. There's intent, why we are doing it. And sometimes we learn something by consequence. My intent was good. What I did also I thought was right, but sometimes the consequence came wrong. Then also we realize oh, that was not the best decision. I, that was not the way. Then we make the best out of it. 
So life never comes with a guarantee of right decisions. So we just have to do the best that we can. But Krishna is so expert that he can bring good even out of the bad. He can guide us in such a way that even if we have made a mistake in the past, from there also, he can take us on the uh, right route afterwards. Okay. Okay. So that was the first word. Which was this word? Anuldaraha. Now let me look at the another word that is describing Krishna. Yatra, what is the word? Yogeshwara. So actually this was what you spoke was, I'm going to elaborate at that point itself. Yogeshwara is the lord of mystic power. So now this word Yogeshwara is significant. Actually it doesn't come many times in the Bhagavad Gita. There's some names which come repeatedly. This Yogeshwara comes only in the 11th chapter and in the 18th chapter. Does anyone know what is the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita? Yes, universal form, the Virat Rupa, where the whole universe is shown inside Krishna. And when Sanjay sees this, he's astounded. Maha Yogeshwaro Hari Darsaya Darshaya Masa Rupaya. He's showing the whole universal form. Ar Arjun is just talking with Krishna. At one moment, in the next moment, Krishna disappears. And he sees this Anek Bahu Dharvak Tradetram. Many faces, many eyes, many mouths. She's stunned. Pashami Yogeshwara Vish Pashami Vishweshwara Vishwarupa. I'm seeing the universal form. He starts offering obeisances over there. So, seeing that astonishing form, the, the word Yogeshwara is used over there. And now, that same word is used over here for Krishna. Why? Because for Arjun, there are going to be many challenges. Although he has taken up the battle, he has become Dhanurdhara. But, and although he is a great archer, the path to success is not going to be a smooth path for him. So, here, the, through the message of the Bhagavad Gita, and through the demonstration of the Vishwarupa by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, Sanjay is conveying to Dhritarashtra that Arjun has Krishna who is the Lord of all mystic powers and he can do miracles he can do astonishing things and that's why he said that even if you think that you have more forces than him you have 11 Akshavanis, he has just 7 you have God is the, the caliber of Bhishma and Drona but still, you, he has Yogeshwara. He can do anything. That is the power of God's mysticism. And the Bhagavad Gita philosophically describes how God can do miracles. And then it demonstrates this majestic, miraculous, mystical vision of the Vishwarupa. Where everything in the universe is present within him. So Krishna can do miracles. And that's why, that, so I mean, Arjuna is looking up and things are looking up. What that means is that we may not find a way ahead, but Krishna can create a way ahead, even if there is no way. Krishna can guide us to find a way, and there is no way Krishna can help us create a way for us also. So sometimes we limit ourselves by having limited faith in God's power. We limit ourselves by having limited faith in God's power. That uh, Krishna can work in ways that we can't even think about. At one level, faith means that yes, Krishna exists, Krishna cares, Krishna will protect. At another level, faith also means openness to possibility. Openness to possibility means that we made a plan and that plan is just not working. We are going along a path and bang, right in front of us, the door closed. And you see darkness all around. What do I do? At that time, when that one door is closed, Krishna is so mystical that even if there is like a thick wall around us, Krishna will create a door for us. Krishna will create a door and will take us ahead. Sometimes when we see darkness in our lives, the mind makes us think this darkness is like a dungeon. But the darkness is not like a dungeon. 
it's like a tunnel. What is the difference between the dungeon and the tunnel? Sorry? Yes, exactly. There is light at the end of the tunnel. A dungeon, it's a prison. There is no way out. So, when we understand this Yogeshwara, even if to our vision, it may appear that this is dungeon, there is no way out. It's just whatever I do, it's just going to lead to trouble. In management parlance, they call this a lose-lose situation. <laughs> but Krishna can pave a way where there is no way out. That is the power of Yogeshwara. We see this in the life of Srila Prabhupada. When he went to America at the age of 70, you know, it was so difficult for him. He had tried for 40 years in India and it had not been very successful. Not many things. Uh, not many uh, people had actually started taking Krishna Bhakti very seriously. And he was going to America. As a completely distant land where he had never been there. Like, so to give a cricket metaphor, it's like a batsman who has played many matches in India and has not done very well. And that batsman goes to a foreign land. If you can't play here, how can you play there? <laughs> That's what people would think. In fact, there was a Sundi Boraji. She was the lady who eventually gave Prabhupada passage to go to America. She said, Swamiji, if you want to speak the Bhagavatam, why do you have to go to America? Just you come to my house every day, I will hear Bhagavatam from you. <laughs> now Prabhupada is not interested in speaking Bhagavatam as a ritual. It is pious ritual. Prabhupada wanted to people to become devoted and dedicated to Krishna. So Prabhupada, when he went alone, he didn't even know whether there would be vegetarian food available in America or not. He didn't even know that vegetarian food would be there on, he had never eaten non vegetarian food. He didn't even know whether vegetarian food would be available on the ship or not. Ship itself was only 40 50 day journey. So he took as much vegetables and grains that he could with him. And when he came to America, he just didn't even know whether to turn left or right. But he just kept taking one step forward, one step forward, one step forward. And Krishna revealed. Krishna worked in such amazing ways that just at the right time, Prabhupada came to America. When he came to America in 1960s, where that was the time when the counterculture was going on. People were very eagerly exploring Eastern spirituality, Indian spirituality especially. And Prabhupada just Krishna arranged for to come, come at the right time. And there was a dramatic transformation. Within 10 years, there were 108 temples, thousands and thousands of people took up Krishna Bhakti across the world. So this is Yogi Ishwara. Krishna can do amazing things. So if we stay very attached to our expectation and our plans, like this is the door and this is how I want to go ahead. And when the door is gets closed, then we keep glaring at the door. Why is this not opening? Or we start crying and we blind our eyes. And some other door opens but we don't even see it. So, we can have our plans, certainly we have our intelligence and we should use our intelligence to make plans. But we hold on to our plans lightly, not tightly. <laughs> lightly. Yes, this is my plan. I do it the best that I can. But if this doesn't work, I am ready. Okay, Krishna, how can I serve you? So if we have that attitude, how can I move ahead? How can I serve you? Then we will see Krishna has his own ways. Krishna is Yogeshwara. And that lord of mysticism is actually with us. It says Krishna was there for Arjun, he is also there with us. That is the second point that Krishna is Yogeshwara. And how Krishna is Yogeshwara is both philosophically and visually demonstrated in the Bhagavad Gita by his the Vishwarupadarshan. And later on in the Kurukshetra war, there are many times when Krishna uses his mystic power to help Arjun. Most famously, when he has to avenge Abhimanyu's death by killing Jayadrat, Krishna covers the sun and he does a mystic power. So I was telling this story in um, in America in, uh, in a university. So one student asked this question. He says, you know, if, if Krishna could have covered the sun, 
కృష్ణ కూడా కిల్ చేయదు తోసు ఇస్ ఇట్ ఇట్ సో వై డిడ్ కృష్ణ హ్యాడ్ టు కవర్ ద సన్ అండ్ అర్జున్ హ్యాడ్ టు గో త్రూ ద హోల్ లేబర్ ఆఫ్ లేబర్ ఆఫ్ గోయింగ్ త్రూ ద హోల్ ఆర్మీ బ్రేకింగ్ త్రూ ఆల్ దోస్ డిఫెన్సివ్ అరేంజ్మెంట్స్ వర్కింగ్ సో హార్డ్ కృష్ణ కూడా స్కిల్ చేయాలి తోసు ఇస్ ద మూడ్ ఓవర్ దేర్ ఇస్ దాట్ యాక్చువల్లీ కృష్ణ wants us to endeavor and krishna wants us also to get the credit so if krishna had just done that then we wouldn't be glorifying arjuna's devotion his dedication his excellence so krishna wants us to endeavor and krishna removes the obstacles then we get the credit for that of course devotees we understand that it is not i who am doing it or not i alone am doing it it's krishna's mercy is also there but krishna can himself by his miraculous powers remove all obstacles but when we endeavor when we strive by that we grow by that we grow in faith we grow in maturity we go in discipline and that growth stands us in great stead in future in our life so this was second point yogeshwara so any reflections on this <coughs> yes please so we i think uh, for me like when you <coughs> when you're struggling like some everything is dark <coughs> and you said you ask you look up and say krishna how can i serve you for me it's the opposite like you know when there is nothing to, i can't do anything then suddenly all i can do is i beg and say you know please help me rather than like you know i don't have that serving attitude i just have please give me like get me out of this and instead of looking for solution <coughs> i look for um, i look for problems why it happened like you know reasoning behind it how do you get out of that thing like you know yeah. you i think that's perfectly reasonable to do so whenever we have a problem we want a solution rather than asking krishna how can i serve you he says please get me out of this you know so why this has happened <coughs> there is human intelligence and divine intelligence and both can point in the same direction but sometimes divine intelligence goes much further than human intelligence so if we have got into some situation and with our intelligence we you do an analysis and we try to find a way ahead we try to find a solution that's good that's using our intelligence in a mode of service but sometimes our intelligence just doesn't work so it's like say a door is closed and you push against the door sometimes the door may break or sometimes somebody may open the door so like that some situation we got into and we are using our intelligence exercising it's about trying to find a way ahead and then we find a way ahead but sometimes this can't so at that time when we can't at that time rather than simply continue the intelligence in a vain quest so there are times normally normally we bhakti means we surrender with intelligence we use our intelligence also to serve krishna to surrender to krishna to do our duties in a mode of service to krishna but there are times when we surrender the intelligence surrender with intelligence and surrender the intelligence krishna i just can't figure this out i just can't figure this out na chaita dvit ma kataranno gariyo yadvajaye me divano jayeyu ya devahatva na jiji vishamaste vastita pramukhe dhatarashtra i don't know what i should do is willing good for me is just leaving this body good for me or just fighting and uh, losing my life over here good for me i don't know so then he turns to krishna you please guide me prachami tam dharma sammoora chetaha so similarly there are times when our intelligence will not work so one definition of intelligence is to know what to do when we don't know what to do <laughs> <laughs> just like say if you are using a new device if you say you have got a oven or a mic or a phone or a like computer and you are fiddling around with this has this this does this this does this and suddenly the device hangs up it stops working then what do i do i don't know what to do then call an expert isn't it so my intelligence has helped me to solve the problem but my intelligence at least tells me call up the expert so like that for us praying to krishna chanting hari krishna in a prayerful mood is like dialing the expert so intelligence means to know what to do when we don't know what to do is connect with krishna and when the why question doesn't lead to any answers then we shift to the how question 
So when you say Krishna, get me out of this, that the mood is the same, but ultimately our mood is that we want to serve Krishna. So Krishna, how can I serve you right now in this situation? What steps can I take so that I can move out of the situation and continue serving you? So that's not necessarily a two different things. Like how can I serve you and please get me out of the situation? This is just a different expression. When it's please get me out of the situation, that is a more uh, more self more self-centered way of looking at things. That's not necessarily bad. Sometimes life puts us in that predicament. But the same situation. Say Krishna, I want to serve you. But in this situation, I just can't see any way how can move forward. So please, guide me how I can serve you. So that prayer itself can also be a service to Krishna. Because praying is also a way of connecting with Krishna. Praying is also serving with Krishna. Okay. Okay. So that was the second point. And now, a Yogeshwara. Mm, okay, so I'll try to take one or two more. Mm. Yatra and there is Matir Mama. So Matir Mama is, what does it mean? This is my opinion. Now we may wonder, Bhagavad Gita is Krishna's words and you want to know Krishna's, Krishna's message. So why is the last word of the Bhagavad Gita my opinion? And there is Sanjay's opinion. Sanjay is simply the messenger. Sanjay is not the expert. So like I say, some very famous doctor writes a book on how to treat a patient and the book gets over and the person who is like the editor of the book or the person who is the translator of the book or whatever is the conveyor of that book's message. The Maybe the publisher of the book or whatever, that person writes, this is my opinion. <laughs> say, who cares about your opinion? <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> we feel like that. But the last word being Matir Mama is, it has a special significance over there. What was the first verse of the Bhagavad Gita? Yeah, Dutra, get recited. Dutra, Stovacha, Dharma, Kshetre, Kuru, Kshetre, Samaveta, Yud, Savaha, Mamakaha, Pandava, Shaiva, Kimakurvata, Sanjaya. So, what happened on the battlefield? Kimakurvata. So, now, generally, when somebody asks, what happened? Say what uh, some dramatic event is going to happen. What what's going to what is what happened? Say like commentary is asking. Say then Arj then Sanjay is giving a factual description of what happened, but based on what happened, mm, he's also giving a prediction of what is going to happen in the future. So when he's saying that victory is going to be on the side of to side where there is Krishna and Arjuna. That means he's saying victory is not going to be on your side. Mm -hmm. Victory is going to be the other side. And now nobody can predict the future. Mm -hmm. Actually, many times we feel the future is so uncertain. This may happen, that may happen, that may happen. And our mind can make us very fearful about the future. Oh, what if this happens? What if you lose this job? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if you get some terrible disease? What if? What if? The mind can make us very fearful and adding to the insecurity and the fear is that we don't know what is going to happen in the future. But the fortunate thing is even the mind doesn't know what is going to happen in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't predict the future but even our mind can't predict the future. So the mind's fears are not like a reliable forecast. You know if you have some very unreliable weather app says tomorrow there's going to be a storm and it's a bright sun tomorrow. <laughs> so hey, this is not a good app. So our mind's forecasts are like an unreliable forecast. So when we start feeling fearful, yes, that may happen. But that may not happen. So the mind is not an expert in telling the future. So Matir Mama indicates that Sanjay is saying that this is my opinion that victory is going to be over there. So he's gently hinting towards Dhritarashtra that your plan is not going to be successful. But that's that's one contextual level of meaning. But there's another deeper, broader meaning. The whole purpose of the Bhagavad Gita is not just to say demonstrate God's glory. It's not to demonstrate 
or establish God's position, not to proclaim God's position. The purpose of the Bhagavad Gita is to transform man's disposition, to change human will so that it is aligned with divine will. That way, like I earlier said, if Krishna had wanted to win the war, Krishna could have won the war by his own, on his own. He didn't even need Arjun. If Arjun said, I, I will not fight, he said, okay, who cares for you? I will, I will, I will, my, my mystic power, I can win the war. But the whole purpose of the Bhagavad Gita is not just to show God's power. It is to transform human will. And the Bhagavad Gita is demonstrating that transformation of the human will at both levels. And the Bhagavad Gita can say, we can say it ends with Krishna's conversation with Arjun. And what is Arjun's last word? Karishe vachanam tava. I will do your will. So I will do your will means that Krishna, whatever he has told in the Bhagavad Gita, that mission has been successful. Arjuna's will has become harmonized with Krishna's will. So the same is demonstrated to Sanjay. Sanjay has also gained confidence in Krishna's omnipotence. Sanjay's will, Sanjay's conception, Sanjay's intelligence has also become transformed. So whatever is God's understanding, whatever is God's plan, whatever is God's will, when that becomes our understanding, that is when we become spiritually realized. So when you want to become, our, the purpose of there is one thing which is faith. Faith means that, yes, I don't know what is going to happen, but I have faith that something good will happen. But there is faith and there is realization. This realization means it's something which we have experienced. The difference between faith and realization is, say if I'm going to a doctor, and I've heard a lot about the doctor, how good the doctor is. And when I take the doctor's prescription, I have faith that I'll be cured. But realization means that I, I have I take the medicine and I get cured. Then that doctor's expertise is not a matter of faith for me. It's a matter of realization. I have experienced it. If I have already been cured and then somebody says, this is a bad doctor. He says, your judgment is bad. Doctor is not bad. I have been cured of it. So similarly, for, Ar for Sanjay, when he is saying that Matir Mama, this is my opinion, that means he is saying that his intellectual conviction has become aligned with the divine revelation. So he got the realization with the divine will, with the divine plan, his intelligence has got aligned, his understanding, his opinion, everything has got aligned with him. So he got the realization of Krishna's power when he saw the Vishwarupa. And that's what he remembers in the penultimate verses of the Gita. Rupa Matyad Bhutam Hare Vismayo Me Mahan Rajan Rishami Chapuna Puna and thrilled on thinking of that awesome form. But Mama. So my my opinion is not talking about subjectivity over here. The, the presence of my opinion is talking about personal realization. It is not just some abstract philosophy which he has heard. Okay, I just report that philosophy. So, no, he has personal realization. This is what I also consider to be true. So, for us, as we grow in bhakti, it's not just uh, growing in years. We see how Krishna acts in our life. We see how Krishna transforms our hearts internally. We see how Krishna protects us externally. And then we start realizing this. What is this? This is true. This is, this is this is not this is my opinion, not in the sense of subjectivity, but in the sense of realization. This is what I have experienced. I'm not just speaking this because I've heard it from someone else. Yes, I've heard it, but I have experienced it myself. So when we speak with realization, then it comes a greater depth and authenticity to what we speak. So that Matir Mama is not expressing sub subjectivity, that Matir Mama is expressing authenticity. That this is my realization. And that's how the Bhagavad Gita is outlined in the process of Bhakti Yoga is meant to give us this realization. Pratyaksha Vagamam Dharmyam. The Bhagavad Gita, when you practice Bhakti as given the Bhagavad Gita, 
we'll ourselves start getting realizations. Say so earlier, you might have been very short-tempered. We start practicing bhakti and we start becoming calmer. Earlier, when stressful situations came, we would just crumble under the stress. But now, we stay more composed. We are able to deal with deal with situations better. That indicates we are maturing, we are growing. And like that, we all get realizations. So this is the significance of Matthir The Bhagavad Gita is not just giving an abstract philosophy, nor is it just talking about divine glory. It is giving lofty philosophy. It is also talking about God's glory. But the purpose of it is to transform the human intention and to give us a realization, to give us personal conviction, to bring authenticity to our spiritual practice. So any reflections or comments about this? Yes? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful point. Senior is not one who has seen years pass by. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. You could say that. If we only, if we keep, if we see only what is near, then we are not really senior. <laughs> we have to see bigger things. We have to see distant things. Our vision has to expand. Thank you. <laughs> Any other points? Yes. Uh, in the hind part of some of the purpose, even when Krishna speaks, the meaning says that it, that is my opinion. Even Krishna says that is my opinion. So, okay. What does it's a good question. So, sometimes when Krishna says this is my opinion. So, what is the significance of that? Yes. Let's look where this is. This 13.3, 13.23 says that. Uh, many places actually. So he says that Chitra Kshetra Ganyor Gyanam Yatta Gyanam Matam Mama. That when you understand Kshetra and Kshetra one who understands matter, spirit, and conscious matter and consciousness, who will understand these things, that the person has knowledge. So now when Krishna is saying this, it's very significant that Krishna does not draw upon his position as God to force Arjun to do his will. Now, Krishna uses reason and of course scripturally based reason but reason and logic to explain to Arjun why he should do what he should do. What he should do. So Krishna even when the Bhagavad Gita when he reveals that he is God, actually if you see, the first time when Krishna says he is God, it is almost like a casual reference. It's he says that, okay, he gives Arjuna the philosophical knowledge and then he says, in the past I gave this to the Surya Dev. Hey, hey, wait a minute, pause, pause, pause. <laughs> How could you give it to Surya Dev? Hmm? So then he says, actually I have appeared many times in the past. So it's almost casually he tells that, uh, yeah, I'm God. <laughs> <laughs> then towards later, he very very, very uh, categorically proclaims, "Aham sarvasya prabhu, matta sarvam pravartate." But Krishna's purpose in telling Arjun that I'm God is not to demand obedience. I'm God. You have to obey me. Otherwise, I'll send you to hell. That is not the mood of Krishna at all. Krishna is saying that. If at all he uses the point that I am God, he uses that point to boost his reasoning. That, therefore, consider my word seriously. So I know, I know the stuff. It's like say, uh, a doctor, if say we go to a hospital and we find that somebody is, uh, some, that some, some person in a white robe tells us that actually I have to do this surgery. Now we may say, okay, I'll take a second opinion and come back. But if we come to know that that person who gave us that opinion is the best doctor in the entire city 
and not only the best doctor in the entire city, all the other doctors have been trained by this doctor. Then, okay, maybe I don't need a second opinion. If you're that expert, then I, I, then I will do what you tell me to do. So when Krishna is telling even his position, that posi telling his position is not to demand obedience. It is to increase the persuasiveness, persuasiveness of his argument. Ultimately, the doctor cannot, fo doctor cannot force the patient to do the surgery. The patient has to consent. Similarly, when Krishna talks about his godhood, that is to enhance his reasoning. That is not to impose his will. So when Krishna says, it's my opinion, it is in the mood of uh, his approaching Krishna. It's, it's like a dialogue between friends. It's a very serious dialogue, but it's a dialogue between friends. And although there is an understanding that Krishna is become the teacher and Arjuna is the student, but still there is a mood of mutual affection. It's if Krishna was just like handing out a commandment to Arjuna, do this, don't do this. Then there was no reason to, for him to speak 700 verses. We have spoken word, word, one word, yudhya. <laughs> Finish. <coughs> Krishna doesn't do that. So when he's saying is my opinion, that is again not in the sense of subjectivity. Because Krishna is omniscient. So his vision and his opinion is the ultimate reality. But he uses this word, is my opinion, to enhance the mood of the conversation. To enhance the flavor of the life. this is a discussion, a conversation, and Krishna is telling his opinion to to enhance the personal personal nature of the discussion. Like a doctor gives a medical opinion. Now that medical opinion, the, the, the top-notch doctor, it's, it's to be taken very seriously. That there, the word opinion is not a, is not to indicate relativism or subjectivity. It is actually to bring gravity, but in a in the context of that discussion. Okay. okay. Yes, uh, yeah. With the first point that I'm going to do, you yeah. said that uh, uh, Duryodhana was not good, so that's why Krishna sees the present and future, so that's why he wants Arjuna yeah. to kill Duryodhana. But uh, what about Bhishma? So he was, I mean, uh, with Krishna. Uh, Bhishma will also continue the wrong path, that's why he wants uh, Bhishma to kill him the battlefield. Hmm. Yes, it's a good question. Why did Krishna want Bhishma to be killed in the battlefield? Bhishma is a very multi-layered character in the Bhagavad, in the both in the Bhagavad and the Mahabharata. Very gallant, very heroic, very learned, and even very devoted. But in many ways, Bhishma is a literalist. Literalist means sticks to the literal letter of the law all the time. Mm -hmm. So there is what is called Niyamagraha. Niyamagraha means it can have two meanings. And one just neglects the Agraha, doesn't accept the Niyam, rules at all. But the other meaning is just holds on to the rules without understanding the purpose of the rules. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, because of his sticking to the literal word of the law, what happened is that he often, is, there are times when he acted grievously wrong. Mm -hmm. So when Draupadi was being dishonored, he just remained silent. Why? Because he had said that I will always be by the side of the ruling Kuru King. Through thick and thin. Now we never thought that the ruling, ruling Kuru King would ever uh, do or allow to be done such a dastardly thing over there. But unfortunately that happened. And then Draupadi appealed to him and he, she was you know, trying to her best to avert, avert this catastrophe. And he said that if Yudhishthir gambled himself first, then how could he have gambled me? So if he was not his own master, how could he be my master? And then Bhishma says over there that actually, you know, yes, if somebody has already sold themselves, lost themselves, then they can't gamble. But they can't gamble anyone else because they don't possess anything else. But at the same time, he says the wife always belongs to the husband. So, considering these both principles, I am confused. And therefore, I cannot give a decision. 
now okay now whether uh, when when he said the wife belongs to the husband it's not in the sense of like a position for domination it's like a position in the sense of protection so whether you consider uh, whether, whether the wife belongs to the husband or not the important thing is that a kshatriya is meant to protect people from being hurt and you get so caught in the technicality of a decision forget the big picture so he let, he passively let a disaster happen and stay silent so that silence cost him dearly and eventually prabhupada also says in the second chapter bhagavata purport that because he remained silent when draupadi was being dishonored it is like a, a terrible crime is happening and the police remain silent at that time and the police are guilty of neglect so bhishma had to be punished for that neglect and of course bhakti works in uh, in often inconceivable ways so at a material level what happened was that wrong doing was grievous and he got a grievous consequence for that there was his body was pierced with so many arrows excruciatingly painful so krishna did not overlook his wrong doing just because he was a devotee But at the same time, Krishna did not overlook his bhakti because he had done wrong. Krishna considered both, and both he considered means that Krishna came to when Bhishma fell on that arrow bed. Krishna came and blessed him, and Bhishma said, "I am so much pain." Krishna said, "I will bless you with absorption so that you will not feel pain." And then Krishna stood before Bhishma, and later on after Krishna Darbar, was heard from him, and he and Vishnu learned scripture from him. And eventually, in Krishna's presence, Bhishma departed. So, whatever devotion we do, that is never lost. Even if we do some terrible wrong things, also the devotion is not lost, and the devotion will lead to the ultimate protection and ultimate liberation. That's what Bhishma's departure was supremely auspicious. In fact, he's the model of how, in the Lord's presence, we can depart from the world. At the same time, if somebody has done something serious wrong, there are consequences for that. so he had to go through those consequences because he with the sticking to the literal word of the law yes he wanted to protect the kuru dynasty he wanted to protect the kuru king but here the kuru ruler was actually the enemy of the kuru dynasty the kuru ruler was only trying to assassinate his cousins to creating a dissension so who side should he be on so because he stood by the literal word of the law without considering the spirit of the law he erred and because of that he had to go through the consequence of uh, dying on the war field okay thank okay. you so let's quickly finish the last point i won't go briefly i will go the last is the first word yatra yatra means what where so where there is krishna and where there is arjuna there will be victory now it's interesting we could say that kundya is gurukshetra and gurukshetra In Kuru Kshetra, the Pandavas will win. He could have said that, but this yatra signifies it's yat, that where or wherever, wherever there is Krishna and wherever there is Arjuna, that there will be victory. And Arjuna represents each one of us. We are all souls like Arjuna. We get into illusion sometimes, and by Krishna's guidance, we can come out of illusion. And just as Krishna and Arjuna went together on a chariot in the Upanishads. the body is often compared to a chariot and on the chariot of the body the soul is there as the passenger just like arjuna was the passenger in the chariot and the intelligence is meant to be the chariot here and when we hear the bhagavad gita when we assimilate the bhagavad gita then we bring krishna as the chariot here we get our intelligence from krishna and in fact our intelligence becomes krishnaized it becomes spiritualized become krishnaized so we make prabhupada says in one initiation lecture that now when you surrender to krishna that means you have handed over the reins of your chariot to krishna so what krishna is saying is that this is not just one what the bhagavata's last word yatra conveys this is not just one historical incident that happened thousands of years ago this is a eternal principle It is not just a specific historical prediction that he is making there will be victory for the Kauravas. He is 
asserting a universal eternal principle that wherever there is Krishna and wherever there is Arjuna, there will be victory. But you say that everybody's heart there is Krishna and Arjuna, isn't it? Like we are all like Arjuna and Krishna is the Paramatma and there is everyone's heart. But the most important thing is Dhanur That Arjuna who has become ready to do Krishna's will. So similarly, if we become ready to do Krishna's will, if we become determined to serve Krishna, no matter how many obstacles, how many discouragements, no matter how many negativities we face in our life, we stay determined to serve Krishna. Then, there, may be, there will be difficulties. But Krishna will help us go through those difficulties. Krishna will help us to grow through those difficulties. So no matter how big the problems we may be facing, how big the obstacles may be, if we persevere in a mood of devotion with Krishna, Krishna will see us through those obstacles. So Krishna does not promise in the Bhagavad Gita a stormless sea. He doesn't say you just become my devotee, there will be no more problems in your life. But what Krishna promises is an unsinkable ship. That storms will be there, but this is a ship, a ship of bhakti, the ship of a determined devotional attitude towards Krishna. It is a ship that no storm can sink. Of course, we may sink if we jump out of the ship. <laughs> if we get scared because of some wave, then think, oh, this wave is so big. Now, if we jump out of the ship, it's a problem. But if we stay in the ship, if we stay determined to serve Krishna, then no matter how big and how threatening the waves may be, the ship is unsinkable. And the ship will not only protect us amidst the storm, but it will also take us through the storm towards Krishna. That Shri Vijayo Bhutir, that victory, that prosperity, that ultimate success of life, is something which can come to every one of us if we stay devoted to Krishna. So the mood of the Bhagavad Gita is, that whatever happens, stay devoted to Krishna, stay determined in the service of Krishna. And if we are determined in the service of Krishna, even through whatever storm like come our way, Krishna will protect us and take us ultimately to Him. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on four main points based on the last verse of the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita and the theme was the Bhagavad Gita's transformational power. In less words than what might be there in the just two pages of a newspaper, the Bhagavad Gita changes Arjun, is completely disheartened before the biggest battle of his life, makes him completely alive and ready to fight. So how does this bring it about? The first was Dhanur Daraha. Yes. Look up and what will happen? Yes, look up and things will look up. So instead of just looking at our situation, look up at the Lord who is ultimately orchestrating all situations. So look up means that from the body, from the material level, look to the spiritual level, look to the soul. So Krishna told Arjun, you're not just you're not killing your enemies. You're actually doing a surgery by which you are separating their pure souls from their impure bodies. So that they are protected and the social body is protected. And then from beyond the soul, we look to the Super soul, the whole Krishna. That Krishna has a plan. You're not fighting against them. You are fighting for me to ex execute my plan. So when we simply look at our plans and they don't seem to be working, you might get disheartened. But we look at the present and plan the future, whereas Krishna looks at the future and plans the present. So when we look up, we can better see this big picture and we can become hopeful and energized once again. Then what a second? Yogeshwara. Yogeshwara means Krishna as a lord of mystic powers can do things which may seem impossible for us. So even if we see the door is completely locked and we are blocked, but Krishna can create a way for us. And that's why we don't lose hope, but wait. Faith at one level means yes, certainty. Yes, Krishna will protect. But faith at a practical level also means openness to possibility. Okay, if this door is closed, let me see which door opens. So if we keep glaring at the door which is closed, or if we keep crying because the door is closed, then we miss out on some other door that may open. So when there is darkness in our life, that darkness is not what? You remember? The darkness is not a dungeon. It is a tunnel. 
just keep moving forward and the darkness will get over krishna has that miraculous power and then i talked about shri prabhupad how prabhupad after being so <clears throat> after having so many challenges in india and not getting really much successes but later on he persevered went to america and just amazing early people were people were reached and transformed by him by krishna's mercy then third was mati dharma that is i talked about the purpose of the gita is not just to proclaim god's glories it is to it is not to just to proclaim god's position but it is transform man's disposition so krishna can do whatever he wants on his own but he wants us to participate he wants us to take credit he wants us to grow so there is faith which we need to take the steps forward but we'll take the step like we we'll take medicine but matir mama indicate that he has got realization he saw seen krishna's vishwarupa this is really god he can do amazing things so the process of bhakti gives us not we use not just faith but realization so matir mama talks not about subjectivity but about authenticity it's not just some theoretical philosophy i heard but it's something which i personally realized and last was yatra that bhagavad is not just talking about a specific historical situation it's talking about a universal principle wherever krishna and arjuna are there like that when in everybody there is super soul in the soul when the soul becomes ready to serve krishna in the chariot of the body krishna will guide that person to victory to some ultimate success in life so rather than getting disheartened by seeing the obstacles we look towards krishna and we focus on krishna the problems may seem very big krishna doesn't promise a stormless sea but he does provide us unsinkable ship if we stay in the ship of service to him we will weather all storms and will attain like sultan destination thank you very much hare krishna can we know whether our will is aligned to krishna's will okay firstly it is not necessary that krishna's will is like only one narrow path krishna is a personal relationship between us and krishna and there are many occasions when arjuna expresses his will also arjuna says i am going to bring down jayadrat this is okay krishna initially says it's a too big a challenge but just no i want to do it he says okay I help you do it. So we shouldn't think that Krishna's will is just like one frozen path, and if we don't find that path, we are lost forever. It is not like that. It's reciprocal. We can say Krishna's will is more like a direction than a path. And so you could say it's like um, GPS. The GPS tells us, okay, go in this, go in this direction, and it also gives us a, it gives us a route to go in that direction. Suppose we are going in a particular direction. and then we are meant to turn right but we turn left and what is the gps freedom 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 so the gps say you need to obey me get lost <laughs> 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 so gps reroutes and shows us the way from wherever we are but then we start getting indicators yeah it was a 23 minutes but now it is going to 27 minutes Now it's become thirty-five minutes. Something is wrong. So, similarly, uh, sometimes uh, when we are going on the path of life, what is God's will may not be so clear. So, we use our best intelligence. We pray to Krishna. We consult some. Uh, if it's a very important decision, we can consult some senior devotees and take their inputs. And then, based on that, we take a decision. but after we take a decision we keep observing that okay is this actually bringing me in a constructive direction or is it taking me some other unwanted direction so the the route and the directions may not seem to be that clear but it is that see there are if we consider there are 100 decisions in our life so we could say there are 
maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 decisions where the right is very clear. Maybe in 30, 40 decisions it's not so clear. In 10 decisions completely unclear. So in general, in the situations where we know what is the right thing to do, if we do the right in that situation, then by that we are showing Krishna that we want to do his will. And the more we do his will, when we know what his will is, the more his will will become clearer to us. Because our own consciousness will evolve. That is tamas, rajas and sattva. There is the mode of ignorance, mode of passion and mode of goodness. So we could say, in the mode of ignorance, our consciousness becomes like a insulator. This is more like the Prabhu's example. He told you about this. It's a, it's a insulator. No wisdom, no insight can flow through it. Whatever goes, it's going to completely block. So, in the mode of passion, uh, it's like a semiconductor. Something goes, something stays. Mm -hmm. Then, in goodness, we become like a conductor. Mm -hmm. And we could say, in pure goodness, we just become like a mirror, full 100% transmitter. Uh, not a mirror, like a, a transparent glass. So basically, uh, we, the more we try to situate ourselves in goodness, that means the more we do the things that we know are right, the more we avoid the things that we know are wrong. By that, uh, even if that doesn't seem to give us guidance in the other confusing situations, but still, uh, that action will raise our consciousness towards sattva, towards goodness. And once our consciousness is risen towards sattva, then getting Krishna's guidance will become much, much easier. So basically, I will say three things. First is that we don't have to worry too much. What if I'm not doing Krishna's will? We certainly need to be concerned. But Krishna's will is not like one plan. We're lost, we're forever lost. Even if we take a wrong turn, we'll always come back on the right track. The second point is that wherever we can, we, uh, wherever we know what is right, we focus on doing that. And by that we show Krishna we want to do his will and we also raise our consciousness. And when we are doing a particular decision, then we try to pray to Krishna, consult senior devotees and try to situate ourselves also in Sattva at that time so that we can take a more mature decision. That way we can move forwards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes. I was reading Bhagavad Gita, bro. Uh, just, just thoughts stuck in my mind. Um, usually, we, we, what we get from people, from Mahabharata, is they say that the whole Kurukshetra happened because of that kingdom. So it was a power struggle. Uh, but Yudhishthira, who was leading the Pandavas, uh, is very virtuous and he is someone who has a clear, he, he understands and he has a clear distinction between materiality and spirituality. So it, it just made me think, surely it's not just the kingdom uh, that they wanted. So is that fair to say that it's, it's all Krishna's thing where Krishna wanted to show what's the right thing and uh, let the Dharma prevail? Okay, good question. So was the Kurukshetra war fought? simply to gain a kingdom or was it it is all Krishna's plan to demonstrate dharma uh, I would say that it's in between both it's definitely not only to gain a kingdom if that had been the case both Yudhishthir and Krishna wouldn't have offered the proposal of just five villages mm -hmm. let's give us five villages and we'll settle peacefully so they offered that that means they just wanted some symbolic gesture of reconciliation. If even that is not coming, then you just cannot live with such a person. So, if I explain elaborately how Duryodhana was so brazenly adharmic, such a person would have been allowed to rule untrammeled, that person would have uh, wreaked havoc in society. So, it was the war was fought to establish Dharma. Hmm? Now, is it that the war was arranged by Krishna? Mm, the word arranged is a little dicey word to use because everybody has free will. 
and it is not that krishna orchestrated duryodhan to fight the war krishna in fact went as a peace messenger and tried in you know, every possible way to uh, dissuade duryodhan sometimes we may we say that i have done everything humanly possible in the case of pandavas you can say they tried everything humanly possible and everything divinely possible also <laughs> krishna is god krishna himself went but duryodhan was not ready to listen even to that therefore it's not that krishna wanted the war <coughs> krishna wanted the establishment of dharma and if duryodhan had been ready to come a little bit on the path of dharma also then the war could have been averted but because duryodhan stayed adamantly on the path of a dharma so then the war had to be fought so the war was not Chris, was krishna's will you can say that the establishing dharma was krishna's will and duryodhan's obstinacy made the war essential for establishing dharma okay great any other questions okay no one else so prabhu ji can i ask something yes, related to prabhu ji's question yeah um sometimes i think that uh, krishna knew that kaliyuga was going to come straight away after dwapar yuga so so because is one of the reasons to fight with kauravas is that because they wanted a good king and dharma to be established but then kalyu kalyu guys are even going to come then why to do all this okay so did krishna want to establish yudhishthir as the king to prevent the coming of kalyuga but then but kalyuga is anyway going to come so then why why fight the war at all why do all this there are two overall trends in the world there is you could say trend is the nature of the world is to degenerate in physics this is called thermodynamics is called the principle of entropy things gravitate towards disorder if they are left on their own and we see if you keep a food item just like that it will get spoiled everything gets spoiled so the nature of the world is things will deteriorate so that applies even to morality and ethics that moral dharma will also decline mm -hmm. now parallel with that we have free will and with that free will say if we own a house but we are not staying in that house then if we go once in month once in three months once in six months we'll see dust has accumulated over there cobwebs are there things will degenerate but we can and should maintain the order so we may go and clean the house or we may hire someone to clean the house we will try to establish order so that is called the principle of negentropy the opposite of entropy that human beings can by their endeavor counter the inevitable decline and establish order now because we are finite beings the extent to which we can counter entropy is finite but we all have been given certain areas certain responsibilities so within that responsibility area of responsibility in sanskrit is called kshetra that is the area of influence within that it is our responsibility to try to keep things as right as possible so that is simply our duty and that alone is not our duty that means we also ultimately things cannot be set right forever in the world but we set them right enough so that we can practice spirituality and rise beyond the world so in the bhagavad gita in 4.8 and 4.9 these two things are talked about the the, the bhagavad gita is spoken for two purposes one is to transform the world and the other is to transcend the world so to the the world transforming mission is talked about in krishna's descent when he says eda yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyuthanam dharmasya tadatmanam sujamya ham paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya dushtutam dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yuge yuge so dharma samsthapana arthaya wants to establish order in this world but then next verse he says janma karma chane divyam evam yogati tatvata tektva deham punar janma naiti mameti so arjuna that if you become devoted to me you will attain me beyond this world so we want to maintain enough order in this world so that we can in a orderly way transcend the world so there is that's why there are both aspects of transforming the world and transcending the world so we could say that kaliyuga's progress is inevitable 
but we as human beings also have responsibility and we even if we can't stop kali yuga we can protect ourselves from the influence of kali yuga and we can protect others from the influence say if it's a storm if weather forecast is heavy rains now if we have to go out for some work then either we can just go like that or recklessly and get soaked or we can take a raincoat or umbrella and then that will protect us and if you have like an umbrella we can protect someone else also so yudhishthir maharaj if he is taking the responsibility as a king as a king he is meant to protect people from adharma from the influence of adharma so when krishna had the whole kurukshetra war fought it is there is a uh, there is a part of krishna's mission that is historical and there is a part of krishna's mission that is trans historical historical means at that time he established dharma now the historical aspect of the mission is never going to be eternal because the nature of this world is everything declines so krishna established dharma and the dharma was there for gloriously for some time but the nature of the world is there is going to decline after some time then parikshit came parikshit also maintained dharma but after parikshit came and went things declined but during that time it was maintained that's the historical aspect but the trans historical aspect is that krishna by doing all this has taught us eternal spiritual principles for living he has given the bhagavad gita as a spiritual guide book through the way the pandavas are protected how the way pandavas act in different situations we get examples and uh, in- incidents that can guide us and inspire us so that is the trans historical benediction or gift of that particular set of incidents and narratives so yes things are going to get degraded but we can protect ourselves and we can protect others so in our situation according to our capacity each one of us is meant to make a difference and that's what the kurukshetra war was about that we make a difference at that time and every generation is going to require its own people to make a difference no matter how great the saints be in the past they are not here to make a difference they are here in the sense that if we try to spiritualize our consciousness and sense share spiritual consciousness with others their blessings will be there for us but every generation the people in that generation has to take the responsibility so you wish to the responsibility of that generation for a pariksh it took the responsibility of that generation and at that time krishna in many wonderful ways empowered them protected them benedicted them Does that answer your question? Thank you. So, shall we stop? Thank you. So, thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Ita Gaur Prema Nande.